Good morning. I am Dr. Praveena Pai, obstetrician and gynecologist with special interest in infertility and reproductive endocrinology. My background, my MBBS was from Vijayanagar Institute of Medical Sciences, Ballari, following which I did my MD in OBG from BJ Medical College, Pune. This was followed by a year's training in endoscopy with one of the experts in Mumbai, after which we, both me and my husband, moved to the United Kingdom for further structured training in the NHS. Having worked and enhanced our skills for eight years, we moved back to our hometown, um, which is Karnataka, uh, and started working in Manipal. I did focused work in infertility and reproductive endocrinology at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and last year have moved to Mangalore. I'm a consultant attached to Shilpa Healthcare Center as well as Manipal Fertility which is a group of which is an undertaking of Manipal hospitals. Coming to the field of infertility, what is it and is it really a big problem? Infertility by definition is the inability of a couple to conceive that is to have children within a year of trying, within a year of having unprotected sexual intercourse. Why that one year? Because statistics tell us that 84% of couples, if all well, should be able to have a baby within that period. If you extend that period to two years, that figure rises to 92%. So really, if all is well, I would advise couples to just sit back, relax and try. However, the same doesn't apply if there are certain special circumstances. So what are these? So say the woman is more than 35 years of age, now we know that there can be a very rapid age-related decline in her ovarian reserve. Hence, we don't advise that she waits a year. I think she should start seeing a fertility expert within six months of trying. Similarly, if she's had history of infections, particularly what is labeled as pelvic inflammatory disease, if she is known to suffer from endometriosis, which is ectopic menstruation, which is a condition where the woman not only sheds blood outside during every period, but there is some amount of reflux of blood into her tummy. So that is endometriosis. If she has irregular periods and has been diagnosed with a condition known as polycystic ovarian syndrome, if she is on certain medications or she's undergone surgery, particularly involving her tummy, yes, for example, laparoscopic cystectomy and other um, such situations. Any of these circumstances in a woman can affect her fertility and in those circumstances she should approach a fertility expert sooner. Coming to the male counterpart, if he has problems with um, intercourse, for example there is problem with erection, problems with ejaculation, there is no semen coming out you know when they have intercourse, okay. If they, he is on um, certain drugs which can impact um, his semen quality. In those circumstances, I would invite the couples to come forward faster and consult a fertility expert. What is it? On the one hand, India's population is burgeoning, yes, and we keep talking about population explosion. So, is infertility really a problem? Is what I often get asked. You'll be surprised to know that 15% at least, and this is just a, a small statistics that we get from some of the articles, 15% of India's population suffers from infertility. So you can do the math, 15% of a billion amounts to a huge number. Unfortunately, infertility is still, um, you know, it has still been attached, uh, last line cut, huh. unfortunately in India, in many parts of the country, um, there is still a stigma attached to with infertility which keeps a lot of couples away from seeking uh, expert advice. These couples surreptitiously will go to other um, uh, you know, practitioners uh, and adopt unscientific methods and many a times I have seen couples who come very late so when the woman is nearing her 40 or maybe even have, having crossed 40 that they actually come for some scientific uh, solutions. So this is why, you know, approaching a fertility expert becomes quite uh, important and in a timely fashion. So let's talk about infertility and what are the causes. To put it very simply, if you look at the causes, they can be divided into causes 
um, affecting the female causes affecting the male causes affecting where you have a combination from both and there are small percentage where despite all investigations there isn't a cause found which is known as unexplained infertility so in women the problem could be with the ovulation so release of egg from the ovary which she does once a month it could be problem with the tubes um, there could be blockage of tubes or there could be distortion of the anatomy of the tubes or the problem could be a distortion or a, a defect in the lining of the womb which is supposed to carry the pregnancy this is very simply put okay it could be a combination of factors coming to the male side of things usually the problem boils down to poor quality of semen either that or the semen is unable to come out um, and hence the sperms are unable to get into the um, cavity so these simply put are the two um, major reasons for infertility there is you know um, a whole lot of centers are mushrooming all over the country and the only thing they seem to be advertising or talking about is IVF IVF known as in vitro fertilization or test tube baby so a lot of couples or women or you know the families are worried um, that the minute they go to a fertility expert it is a test tube baby which will be uh, doled out to them as a treatment oh, this this is a fallacy I think I want to bring a message very clearly out and the message is that consult a fertility expert because many a times very simple solutions will do the job what we do when a couple first comes to us is to take a very thorough history because history gives us a lot of information as to what might be going wrong after a thorough history we do a, a proper examination for the woman as well as a semen analysis for the man along with the physical examination and a vaginal examination for the woman we put her through simple investigations which could be blood investigations plus of course a pelvic ultrasound scan with all this we are able to come to a diagnosis in most of the couples if we are suspecting a problem with the tubes then we have to do a, a test for tubal patency this could be in the form of a hysterosalpingogram which is an x-ray or this could be done laparoscopically that is by putting a camera and a, a couple of tubes into the tummy both of them are fairly straightforward tests at this point I would like to mention one more aspect see infertility again when we teach our students is of two types what is known as primary infertility is a condition where the couple is struggling to have the very first baby secondary infertility on the other hand is somebody who's become pregnant once and in a subsequent pregnancy are, is struggling to conceive no matter what happened to the first pregnancy so it may be that she's had a first baby which you know went through smoothly and she's got a live child or it may be that in the first pregnancy she did conceive but it ended with a miscarriage so whatever the case if she has been pregnant once before then it is labeled as secondary infertility and the reason it's important to differentiate between these two is because the causes for the two are slightly different if the woman has conceived once no matter how the pregnancy ended if she has managed to become pregnant once it means that she's ovulating that means she's producing an egg it means probably that the sperms are of an average or above average quality it means that the tubes are working properly okay so then we need to focus on what might have happened thereafter okay is it that the age has um, come in the picture that she has become much older okay has she picked up an infection subsequently because of which the tubes have got damaged or is it that the person the male for example has taken to alcohol or smoking because of which the semen quality has deteriorated so our thinking changes and that's why that's why I come back to the fact that the history taking becomes very important so once the couple comes to us we've done a thorough history taking we've done the basic investigations okay and we hone down to what the cause might be if we find that the problem is with ovulation like in a case of polycystic ovarian syndrome then the solution is fairly simple we can give them simple tablets which is usually for about five days okay to stimulate 
the follicles in her ovaries to grow so as to produce a dominant follicle. We see the response to these medicines by doing ultrasound scan. Once we know that a nice dominant follicle is formed, we can cause egg release by giving an injection or just waiting for natural ovulation. <clears throat> and then we can ask the couple to have intercourse for the uh, coming 4 to 5 days, thus enhancing her chance of becoming pregnant. So this is known as ovulation induction, follicular tracking and timed intercourse. Instead of timed intercourse, if the same thing is done, but we take a bit of the um, husband's semen sample, process it so as to get good quality sperms and then slowly insert it into the woman's um, womb, then this process is known as intrauterine insemination. <coughs> Two patients are there? Okay. Their daughter and mother and Okay. Uh, five minutes out. Okay. So, where were we? Okay, so internal. So these, as I mentioned, are fairly straightforward and simple um, treatments. They are very cost effective. All it takes is um, a scientific fertility expert and a motivated couple who will keep up with the treatment. Okay, and a motivated couple who will keep up with the follow-ups. We can do these now. We know that with intrauterine insemination, the conception rates are between 10 to 12 percent. Hence, if she is responding well, we offer between 2 to 3 intrauterine insemination cycles. Let us say if this has not worked, then we move on to the next step which is known as the test tube baby in or in vitro fertilization. So what happens here? In in vitro fertilization, the woman is invited after thorough investigations and we stimulate the ovaries it is known as controlled ovarian hyperstimulation with injections. So, there are no tablets involved, it is usually injections which are then given over 9 to 10 days to try and stimulate the ovaries to produce a good number of eggs. These eggs are then removed under ultrasound guidance under a short general anesthetic. The same day, the husband's semen sample is taken and these two together are um, given to our a scientist which is who is the embryologist who then fertilizes these in the lab conditions in the laboratory. Okay. Three days later we look at good quality embryos. So between three days to five days we select maybe two sometimes three good quality embryos and these are then transferred again under ultrasound guidance into the woman's womb. So this entire process takes about 15 days. After the embryo transfer is done, we give some uh, medicines and injections to try and support uh, an upcoming pregnancy. And 15 days subsequently, we bring the couple back to do a blood test to see if the um, pregnancy has happened or not. So this entire exercise takes 15 days for another 15 days for the results altogether a month. Couple are worried about the cost, doctor, why is it so costly? <clears throat> the cost is because of two things. One is the injections, which um, are gonadotropins. Usually they are recombinant, sometimes they are highly purified, but whatever the case, they um, are a costly set of injections. The second set of cost is attached with because we have to maintain very high quality um, uh, embryology laboratory and the instruments used, the microscope used, everything um, has to be maintained to world standards. So consequently, the cost is a significant amount, but it, it, it is not exorbitant or out of reach. The success rate uh, with IVF, we say, is anything between 45 to 50 percent. So once the beta HCG result comes positive, then we follow up the woman with regular scans to see if the pregnancy is going on well. Most pregnancies go on quite well and are then looked after by the obstetrician. A few of them unfortunately can result in miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies which is entirely similar to if the woman conceives naturally. Apart from this, there are more advanced techniques which have now um, 
come into our um, armamentarium, you may have heard of a term known as ICSI. ICSI, I C S I, stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So, in those situations where we find that the sperm quality is not to the extent that the sperm itself will be able to come penetrate the egg and create an embryo in those situations our embryologists have a look under the microscope and they themselves select the best looking sperms and directly inject them into the egg this is known as intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. So this is another excellent techniques and a huge number of babies have been born through ICSI in the world and they are when these babies were followed up they are all doing fairly well. So what else? Now you all know that any branch of science does not like to rest on its laurels. So there is a lot of activity, a lot of research going on in the branch of infertility as well. There are situations where the woman is unable to produce um, good quality oocytes or she may have reached the menopause in very early which is known as premature uh, ovarian failure or premature menopause that is hitting menopause before the age of 40. Very often we get these women who are very distraught, very disappointed but fortunately now we offer another um, treatment modality which is known as donor egg IVF. So what we do here instead of stimulating the woman in question we invite a younger woman and this has to be anonymous this is according to the rules and um, regulations laid down by the ART bill um, which is uh, very much applicable here in our country. So an anonymous donor with proven fertility so she should have had a child in the past okay she should ha have no medical problems she is screened properly for all this and then she is stimulated eggs are collected from her these are then fertilized with the commissioning so the couple which is commissioning the donor is known as a commissioning couple so the eggs which are retrieved like this are then fertilized with the husband's um, uh, sperms okay the embryo which is so created is then transferred into this commissioning mother's womb so this program is known, known as donor egg IVF so this is another tool which is available um, for suitable um, candidates as progress is being made we have other um, facilities now available so there are situations where the woman's womb is found completely destroyed or unsuitable for carrying a pregnancy in those situations we can borrow a womb which is a very late term so essentially we can create a pregnancy with the couple however the pregnancy is then transferred into the womb of another um, lady who is known as a surrogate and this process is known as, known as a surrogate pregnancy or surrogacy. Of course there are rules and regulations which are very which need to be very strictly adhered to and one should always keep as fertility experts we need to keep ourselves updated with the latest because these rules keep changing. More recently you may have heard of oocyte freezing, embryo freezing, semen banking. So these are all other methodologies which are available. Semen banking has been there for a while. It is a tried and tested method. So let us say the husband is going to go abroad and is not around to give us a fresh sample every time. We have got established methods, we have got semen banks so he can store his semen um, samples and you know the treatment for the wife can be carried out in his absence. Oocyte freezing, so there are situations, now oocyte freezing is something which we do not encourage uh, in women purely because they want to um, you know uh, have pregnancies later in life because they want to follow a career but definitely it is a beneficial method where women for example uh, have been diagnosed with cancer yes and we know that if they undergo chemotherapy the gonads that is the ovaries will get destroyed in those situations we can before she undergoes chemotherapy we can stimulate her bring the eggs out if she has a partner if she has a husband at that time we can create embryos and free freeze the embryos okay this is embryo freezing if she doesn't have a partner but she definitely is interested in infertility in the future then we can freeze the oocytes. So as you can see there has been a lot of progress in the field of infertility we have got semen banking, we have got embryo freezing, we have got egg freezing. Okay. 
And last but not the least, um, you know, as you know, the scientists never rest. What about women who are born without a womb? What do we do with those? So more recently, you may have heard of instances where scientists from Sweden and more recently in India have transplanted the womb from one lady into another, which is a, it, it is a large, you know, it's, it's a very long process, uh, a very meticulously done, a meticulously done surgery. Um, so uterine transplantation um, has been offered. Okay, it's not something that we offer regularly because it has its own problems. However, that's another um, advanced option which is slowly becoming available to women who do not have a functional uterus of, of their own. So in summary, my take home message for um, the people watching this is that infertility is here. 15% of India's population suffers from infertility, so we cannot shy away from the fact that infertility is a real problem. Let's remove the stigma attached with it. Let's look at it as any other medical problem. Seek the advice of a fertility expert in a timely manner so that he or she can evaluate you appropriately in a timely fashion and find solutions so that you can have children um, and um, have a, a family that you so desire and deserve. Thank you.